Uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I think big picture, I'm pretty on board, but I had some questions about point one, the, the other uh, forms of energy available. Yeah. Um, are there any, so I don't really know anything about uh, Saudi Arabia, are there any issues in terms of intellectual property or international companies working in Saudi Arabia that they can point to as a reason why they can't just go with the, uh, what was the, the name of that gas plant? The all fuel? I think it's called net power. Net power? Yeah. I, you know, I, I, the, beauty, the beauty of some of my briefs is the, the best answer I can give is don't know working on that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly a concentrated solar power is a no-brainer. That's, that's happening. It's interesting. When you go to this net power um, site, and it is an interesting site to go to, they talk about the Middle East as a major market for this product. At least they think it is. Now, you know, let's be clear. That thing has only been operating for a year. It operates at much higher temperatures. And, it's, it, it re and one of the questions is, will the materials have the surface life that you want? I mean, maybe it breaks all the time, and it's, it's a mirage. But it's something to look at. The concentrated solar, yeah, we kind of know that works. And, and, um, but I think if we do know regular gas works, and gas-fired plants are pretty efficient. They're, they run at about a 60% 60, 60 efficiency. And yeah, they release you know, pollutants, but nothing like coal, nothing like oil. And you know that could be a bridge to whether this works. This could be a bridge to more renewables. The point is, you need to go to 11 cents per kilowatt hour, like a hole in the head. And you need to enrich, well, even worse, less. I mean, it's just gradations. I didn't answer your question, did I? Sorry. What I said, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> this is, well, use Google, read. I mean, in other words, this is a moving story. It's fun to watch. It's something different. When I bring this up in Washington, people go, huh? When I bring this up at, at Rice University, they know all about it. What does that tell you? Okay. Oh, we have one here and one here. Uh, why don't we start back there? Um, can I see the previous slide? Yeah. Because um, I'm a I'm a naval officer in uh, South Korea, and I, I'm a submarine officer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm really curious that uh, do you think that the uh, development of uh, new nuclear subs in Korea is bad for uh, non proliferation? Because uh, our baseline for developing the nuclear submarine is yeah. not violating one three agreement. So. Well, no, you're not. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> you know, particularly if you get the fuel somewhere else. No, I, actually, my objection to it is it's a lousy way to do ASW. It's really a super expensive alternative to using that money, given the kinds of seas. I had a major study done by uh, someone who was pretty senior in the American Submarine Service, and it will be coming out. What you can do for even the lowest cost version of these things alternatively is so much better in dealing with ASW and surface fleet threats. I just think this is, you know what this is? This is a Korean version of what we had. It was called the atomic airplane, which was a great idea, but it didn't, it didn't really solve any problem. This thing is very popular. Your president is very enamored of it. Believe it or not, our president, when he first heard it, didn't know anything about it. said, well, yeah, that sounds kind of neat. But if you, if you really do the homework on ASW, um, having a nuclear submarine is a, not only a luxury, but it comes at a really high regret. So I don't think the nonproliferation argument is the central argument. But I can tell you this. If South Korea gets enrichment, if South Korea recycles, it's going to drive <coughs> your neighbors crazy. And of course, if they do it, it'll drive you crazy. Everybody's crazy there. So we need to kind of slow down. And if we don't need it, we need not to need it. And one of the things we need to do is lean on the Japanese not to open up Rikasho. And we need to lean on the Chinese not to use our programs to justify going to fast breeder reactors. I hate to say it, but the United States government's going in the wrong direction here. We're talking about how advanced, fast reactors and recycling are the next great thing. I want some of my money back. We should just say no for the moment. 
R&D, yes, but not, but not anything commercial. Now, I think he was next, but, and, then, and then you too. So this might be a little too technical, but what but, By the way, did I answer your question? Good? Okay. By the way, it's a good question. Okay. Uh, but what is the life expectancy of like a concentrated solar plant or a solar plant versus, say, like a nuclear plant? And is that cost included in like the kilowatt per hour? Those are, li those are levelized uh, okay. costs. And so, yes, they are. Okay. So and yeah. I would I expect that drives up the cost of nuclear considerably given the costs. Well, I think that the, the key cost with nuclear uh, is uh, the capital cost of construction, uh, followed by another thing that people uh, now are coming to terms with as these things get older. You know, you need a lot of people to run one of those things compared to these other plants. And so what we're discovering is even when you've amortized the cost of construction and the fuel costs are low, the operating costs are still a pain <laughs> in the tail. And so, you know, all of these companies in the United States are asking for additional subsidies from the state just to keep these things operating. It's bizarre. That wasn't supposed to happen. So at the tail end, the operating costs are also, you know, a little bit, a lot more than some of these alternatives. But it's the capital cost for sure. And what happens here is if you delay construction by a year or two, capital costs go through the roof and you have no revenue coming in to, to service that, that note. And that's how things like VC Summer and Vocal and all of that, I don't know, I see some nodding heads. You can write the name down in your hand and go look it up on Google. These are power plants that went way over budget and beyond schedule in the U.S. And it's bad news bears for what, what the cost of electricity is when that happens. So it's a real problem. There were two questions over here. Yes? I'm curious about how the proliferation of nuclear technology in Saudi Arabia might impact the potential for nuclear terrorism? Um, How should I put it? You're an optimist. Well, Let me stage the problem for you so that you feel better about the guy with the ski mask. Okay. I don't think the ski mask guy is the big deal. And the reason why is kind of like the problem with dirty bombs. They're, most of the most interesting dirty bombs have an incredible uh, capacity to kill the fabricator. Uh, and I think the nuclear terrorist has so many other wonderful ways to terrorize us that he tends to get distracted before he goes for this complicated route. That's just me. I can tell you, I, I served on a commission where both of the, or well, at least one of the, the members was really interested in impressing the intelligence agencies. And so we, we were over there a lot. And uh, he kept demanding, well, where's your evidence of nuclear terrorism? And they said, well, we... Get this, they said they were spending upwards to 10% of whatever budget was. I mean, if, God only knows what that number is. I, you know, it, it was more than, more than our allowance for many months. Okay? It was an enormous sum of money. Isn't it? And we haven't found any actionable, specific intel. Now, I don't think that's changed. That was 2010, but you know, it might have. But I can tell you something you should worry about. And then I'll get back to make you feeling better about the guys in the ski masks and why you, yeah, you can still worry about them too if you want. Um, we are geared right now to debate over how to deal with Chinese and Russian nuclear weapons. And we're generally, as a culture, geared to thinking in five to ten years about that. And in the next five to ten years, we can debate, you know, well, it won't be as bad as you think. No, it'll be worse than you think. But in, when you get done with what that delta is, you're talking about scores or hundreds of things. With the fissile material uh, that we're talking about that could be reprocessed or enriched and the surpluses that we're talking about, we're not talking about scores or hundreds. We're talking about a China that might get a facility that would, not in five to 10 years, but to 10 to 20 years, be able to produce thousands or even 10 to 20,000 bombs worth of uh, fissile material on surplus that within, I would think, 36 months of a decision could turn into to actual devices. Uh, and in the case of Japan, by the way, this is smaller with regard to India, maybe it would be thousands. But that's interesting. And then in the case of Japan and South Korea, they wouldn't break out with one or two or even 10 or 20. 
they would get a small arsenal within 36 months or less. I'm talking about several hundred. We as a culture, strategic, military, whatever, have like no frame of reference for dealing with that. I have no idea of how we would deal with that. We don't have a whole lot of history to work with. We'd have to start going to the school and ask them to figure out what the answer is. I mean, you know, have at it. Also, if we go ahead and allow that kind of material to be generated, the prospects for some of it being filched, oh, go up. So if you want to start worrying, but I would do it in that order. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Okay, cool. Next question. That was actually going to be my first question. So <laughs> uh, I'm curious, especially when, when you lay out the benefits of switching to other sources of power and stuff like that, what reason does a country like the United Arab Emirates have to keep a civilian nuclear program? Couldn't we try and take steps to help them denuclearize for, in favor of lower cost power? And that would yeah. restrict us as much in terms of our negotiating with other countries where we can't give them any. The well, I, I have to say, I. First of all, I like the way you think. And the reason I say that is almost everybody in Washington suffers uh, from what uh, my, my mentor, Albert Wolstetter, once described. He said, you know, it would be nice if we could just stop making our mistakes hereditary. And what he meant by that is that there is a given view about, you know, oh, Nuclear power is safe if you safeguard it. If we made a decision to let someone have it, that was a good decision. And if it was a bad decision, well, we can't say that. And he'd say, well, but if it's a really bad decision, like helping the Shaw get reactors, it wasn't a great decision now that we have Bushir and all the other things that went with it. It would be nice to admit, well, we made a mistake. But our tendency in government is to make sure that our resumes don't look like crap. And so we don't admit to any mistakes. It's kind of the reason why there are places like this and people, I hope, like you, who say, well, wait a minute, let's, let's think big. Now, having said that, no, I don't think that's practical. <laughs> but I think it would become more practical over time if, in fact, the economics continue to look that bad. And I think it's important to pay attention to these numbers. I think as the numbers become clear, we should be clear that no, nuclear power is not the way to solve energy or environmental problems. But you've got to have the numbers, and people have to be convinced of the numbers. But the numbers are out there, and they may be getting more and more compelling. And when they do, your point is the point. I explained to someone earlier this morning, they said, well, how do we save the NPT re uh, regime? I said, well, I don't know what, you know, the regime, I have this image of people with togas drinking wine or something. Uh, the regime, okay. Well, I said, look, as long as people think that a quid pro quo for having uh, inspections is to help people generate neutrons that can irradiate material that can be turned into bombs, we know how the story is going to end, poorly. I said, at some point, you got to hope that doing that for a lot of big purposes, let's say for power, you know, maybe for research you do, it doesn't make sense. And if you can't make that argument, we're kind of, that regime is in trouble. So your point's pretty important. You, you, get, you get extra credit. Yeah, go ahead. That recently Iran and America have become increasingly like polarized. Uh, like, for example, yesterday I believe Iran made American military considered a terrorist group. Um, <laughs> well, it's a, you know, even Stephen. <laughs> yes. My question is do you think it's possible that Saudi Arabia is trying to prepare in advance and realize that maybe America's stronghold on Iran's like deterrence of a nuclear program? is loosening its grip and therefore maybe they're trying to like prepare for that? Well, they don't trust us. And if they don't, I don't think it's smart to double down and trust them on more and more and more. I mean, uh, one of the things I say is, okay, maybe we need to be friends with Saudi Arabia. Maybe we need to help them fight this dreadful war. Maybe we, okay, fine. But you know, there's a point at which you, you just say, well, but no, we don't do that. You do not give them the means to make nuclear weapons. 
You take that off the table. There are midpoints here. You do not have to be pro or anti-Saudi to figure this one out. I actually have Saudi students, okay, so it's not like I'm, you know, against Saudis. They're some of my best students, so, I mean, come on. And they work in the Saudi embassy, right? So that's not the issue. The issue is, at what point does being a friend get turned on its head? I would say it would be when you get into this. That's all. And as far as what the Saudis think they're doing, all I can say is anybody who thinks they can use nuclear weapons to have their way free of the activity of key allies, Russian, Chinese, or American, they probably haven't thought it through. That's all. That's my guess. Particularly if they're dependent on them. Yeah? Does, that, does that help? I mean, I, you can tell I'm barely uh, in command of this. But uh, just a general rule of thumb, I think. Oh, okay, cool. So, uh, so your, the bottom line for you was just say no. And I thought that was cute. Uh, I'm, tr sure I'm, that I'm that trying to be, I am fit. trying to be cute. <laughs> I'm not sure that shirt would fit Nancy Reagan. But no, uh, uh, I'm sure it's it, a little big for her. Uh, uh, by the way, that program didn't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there's something maybe, uh, you know, uh, hopeless about this. In the 1980s, I'm barely yeah. aware of that. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> All right. Well, I was in Washington. I was okay. fairly Which is, you know, there's a subtext there for, for your message as well. What would doing no look like? Because one of the things you told us was that the Saudis may not even be interested in our reactors, so or our not really our reactors, that they might be interested in South Korean yes. reactors or other people's reactors. So embargoing reactors isn't going to stop them from... Well, no, 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 no. First of all, let, let's be clear. Uh, the industry now finally... I wrote this up saying, you know, there is a way to do this where they don't need to have a 123 with us. They can. There's a way to buy the smart reactor or even this APR 1400, get around the rules, the enrichment, I already said, wow, man, what a nerd. They now publicly admit that that's true. Now, it could be they just read my thing and thought I was a genius, or they figured it out on their own, whatever. I, all I can say is small to medium-sized minds think alike on this. It is feasible. But if we may not have, you know, if we have any leverage over the Saudis, I bet you, our friend back here there can probably confirm this, we probably still know how to call Seoul and say, you know, could you do us a favor? Don't sell. Don't sell. We have so many things to ha that they need help on, military and civilian. One of the things I'm doing is trying to, to clarify the ways in which the United States and, 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 and the South Koreans need to get closer to one another on a whole host of things that actually initially don't cost anything. And one of them is energy planning. And I think a lot of the stuff about natural gas that I showed you is like quadruply important in East Asia and places like South Korea. <coughs> there are so many things that we really are close on in a way that, unfortunately, we're not that close on with Saudi Arabia. So I think we have some leverage there. No, I believe that. I wanted you to lay out what you thought was sort of the best candidates for that leverage. What kind of leverage? I think I, my, my, I don't like uh, browbeating. It, it's, I've tried it. it. It doesn't work real well. I think you, you have to have uh, the areas that we're looking at. When I say we, I have a little group of, of young entry-level professionals in the government. We're pretty bright. We've, we've identified a couple areas. Uh, one area would be we don't talk about how to protect nuclear facilities against uh, North Korean attack. I think that's kind of nutty. We should. And there are a lot of things that can and cannot be done. And it may be when you get clear on what those problems are, maybe you don't build so many, you know, or you build them differently. Two, the South Koreans are very interested in a lot of space industry. So are we. 
We, however, do not yet have an agreement to share data on where things are in space. And they and their private firms keep track of certain things, and we do too. We can exchange that information. That becomes super important for command of space, both civil and military. Another area I just mentioned. If you take a look at the most likely energy revolution between now and the next 20 years, it's going to be the relative position of oil, gas, and coal. Gas is coming up, oil's coming down, coal's coming down. How do we exploit this? We have comparative advantages in discovering and fracking and prospecting and burning. How do we share that in a way where we don't lose control of technology, but we share the benefits? I can tell you the Japanese and the South Koreans and the Chinese are very interested in that. We should pursue that. I can keep going, but it's things like that. It may be explaining how, I, it was my understanding we have not given the South Koreans an ASW brief on how to optimize for, for investments. You gotta be kidding. We can do that. You can do it unclassified. Does that, yeah. Yeah. Would it be fair if for instance, if I'm trying to sell these kind of points to somebody, would it be fair to, instead of thinking of it as non-proliferation assets, think of it as maintaining leverage that we have over existing assets? We need to make sure that we <laughs> yeah. can control them to a degree that they don't act out of our interests? I, I, I like, again, what you're saying. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think people think non-proliferation is something like, uh, I don't know, peace studies or some you know, or like some kind of specialized social science sliver or something. It isn't. <laughs> Properly understood, it's more like the kind of language you were coming up with. It's essentially, how do you keep the, the sort of the tip of the iceberg of the diffusion of power, which is strategic weaponry, from going places in, in a way that you can't maintain your friendships or defend yourself against potential adversaries? When you read Sung Su, one of the most interesting observations he makes after he says, try to defeat the other fellow's strategy to defeat you in his mind so you don't have to bleed and he'll never fight you. The second thing is maintaining your alliance relationships. Don't let him disrupt them. One of the problems with the spread of nuclear weapons and long range missiles is it encourages friends to go ballistic, nuclear, and their own way and they can drag you into a war. So yeah, you kind of have a stake in seeing how this works. And it's bigger than something uh, that's limited to, uh, I don't know, people who wear Birkenstocks or something to be totally politically incorrect. I don't own a pair, so I understand they're very comfortable. Okay, all right. I mean, this is not for just, you know, hand-wringing people. Hard-headed people need to pay more attention to this. Okay, well, I hope you will join me in thanking our uh, guest speaker. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.